I'm, I'm just it's, a, it's, a, it's an informal group, so I just uh, Paul Gilbert is here, by the way. So that's why I was. Oh, wonderful. But he, but wonderful. yeah, but I can't make him a, 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 a panelist because he's logged in a different way. Hi, Paul. How are you? I'll make you unmute you. If, if you want to speak, that is okay. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Did you? Is, no, I got decided to send it. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Yanis. Hi, nice Paul. Hello. Hey, hey, good. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. How are you all doing? Fine. Good. Mm -hmm. Fine. Good to hear you. Good to hear you. Is Nat uh, connected? Can uh, Nat? Can you? Nat, hear? Nat is connected, but I think he is uh, hesitating to jump in because he can okay. unmute sure, himself sure, and sure. He can talk. Okay. But maybe yeah, he's yeah. just uh, getting warmed yeah. up. Hey, there he is. There he is. Hi, hi, Natarajan. Hi, uh, Natarajan. What a pleasure to hear your voice. <laughs> yeah. I can connect with you here. How are things in California? Is it cold? It's a uh, pretty warm. Um, yesterday was about seventy-five degrees or so. So oh, that's nice. it's very, that's uh, that's like. very different. <laughs> <laughs> that's like what I'm, it is in India. I'm in India, I'm now, in so Europe. it's like that here. Yeah. Um, uh, where are you, Krishna? I'm in Hyderabad. Yeah. I, I moved back. I retired from UMass Lowell last uh -huh. year and moved back to India, relocated. Yeah. yeah. I was yesterday with uh, Eric Garcetti. The incoming ambassador to the United States, to the to India. Hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So he's uh, he's uh, moving to he's the mayor of Los Angeles, as you know, and he's he's coming to India as the uh, as the uh, ambassador to the of the U.S. to India. So oh, okay, very excited to uh, to come to India. So he told me next time I visit India to go and. And sing him. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's a wonderful guy. So we will wait for another two three minutes and get started, Yanis. And uh, we have a, you know, some people I put on the panel, some people and good people are in the audience as well. So we'll have a good discussion. So I hope you uh, can keep your presentation to how many minutes did you plan? You tell me and I'll do it accordingly. So At I have 30, 40 minutes and then we can yeah, just engage uh, okay. in discussion. Yeah, um, sure. Um, is this a, a total of one hour? Yeah, total one hour. Yeah, so we okay. just want to get so some, yeah, all right. So I'll, 40, I'll, 40 uh, minutes, maximum. 40 minutes okay. max. After that, 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Welcome everybody. We will start in a couple of minutes, okay? Um, if I click this, you tell me, uh, uh, how do I see my screen? Uh, you're not able to see a screen? 
Oh, well, right okay. Now, you have to, you have to so. move some windows around. You should be able to see your screen. You might have to just uh, hide some of the other things that are open, close down some other windows. Uh huh. So let me see here. Mm. No, not not that. Okay. Yeah, and it's we can all see your okay. screen. Now, uh, I, you now should I see. see it. It. Now you can see now, it. Now, now I see. It. Now I see. It. No problem. Okay. Yep. Can you see us? Can you see your uh, camera also? Can you see yourself? No, but I can if I want to. I suppose. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, we can see you. That's why you should be able to see yourself too. But it's you, know, it's, you can turn it off if you want the camera if when the time comes. Uh, 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 so, but it's up to you. So I'm going to just introduce you and um, yeah, yeah, and then I, get and this, and step anyway. out of the way. Sure. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, okay, folks, everybody, good evening and uh, welcome to a fascinating topic, a fascinating webinar, and a fascinating gentleman who is going to be presenting it today. Uh, and one of our you know, strong, you know, dedicated leaders of engineering education in the world. Uh, this is, um, you know, I hope everybody's doing well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in um, all parts That's of the world. Good. I think, in fact, our speaker today is um, is in California. So uh, it's six o'clock in the morning for him. So thank you so much for for taking the time to get up that early and join us. Uh, Dr. Yanis, yeah, I see Yotsos is the Dean of uh, uh, University of Southern California, Viterbi School of Engineering, and the Zorab Kapri Lian Chair in Engineering, a position he holds since 2005. Uh, Yotsos served as Chair of the Department of Chemical Engineering between 1991 and 1996, and Associate Dean, and then as Senior Associate Dean for Academic Affairs between 2001-2005. Since 1995, he holds the Chester Dolly Professorship. He received a BS in Chemical Engineering from National Technical University of Athens, Greece, and a Master's and PhD from the California Institute of Technology, all in Chemical Engineering. His research areas are in fluid flow, transport and reaction processes in porous media, with specific applications to subsurface. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. That's a big deal. In 2008, and since, 2000, and since July 2017, he serves as a member of the National Academy of Engineering Council, another big deal, very prominent positions he's been held. In 2011, he was awarded the distinction of being honorary member of AIME. In 2013, he was elected associate member of the Academy of Athens. And in 2014, he received the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Oh, that's interesting. So it's a pleasure, really pleasure to have such a distinguished speaker for us today as I'm talking about a very important topic. And I'm gonna just uh, turn this over to you uh, in just a second. Okay. Are, we recording, are we recording, are we recording Krishna? I'm not hearing the recording. It is being recorded, yeah. Okay. It's being recorded, the session is being recorded, yeah. Okay. Over to you, Yanis. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna. And it's a pleasure to be with everyone here today. <laughs> I, right now I'm staring at my screen, so I'm not sure that I see everyone, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I am uh, very uh, pleased and honored to be part of this uh, uh, seminar today. Uh, it's uh, indeed a little early here in California, but uh, it's uh, something that uh, those of us in the West Coast are used to. Uh, the world is a little bit more East Coast centric. And so we do we do need to uh, uh, adjust to that reality, and we have been adjusting to this reality for a long time now. Um, so I am uh, again uh, uh, very pleased to be here, and I want to talk a little bit about something that I have been thinking for a while, um, given the fact that uh, technology is becoming so powerful today, and uh, this is the issue of trustworthiness. Um, I have uh, been using this word this word of trustworthiness in terms of um, uh, essentially uh, um, making explicit perhaps the obligation that we have as engineers to not only have the technical prowess to solve big problems but at the same time the if you wish the character to solve the right problems and also be able to understand the unintended consequences that come as a result of the fact that technology is very powerful. And I will try to explain through my presentation uh, the various uh, threads of thoughts that have is leading me in this direction. I should mention that at the um, Engineering Disease Institute, which is coming up uh, about a month from now, actually exactly one month from now, 
in Las Vegas, um, there is a journey session on um, what we call educating trustworthy engineers and try to understand uh, how we can um, essentially incorporate a number of new uh, items and uh, topics in engineering education, something that's already done in many universities, but perhaps this is something that has to be done throughout um, uh, curricula in higher education in, in engineering as well. So my summary is the following, and I will basically, this is a slide, which is uh, in a, a, a slide that is, I will expand on uh, as, as I move through the presentation, but the key points are the following. Technology creates exponential change uh, and he has the promise of doing unprecedented progress to solve grand challenge-like problems. So the world grand challenges, moonshots are uh, words with, that you will hear more and more in the presentation because they are essentially uh, intricately re related to technology today. Uh, we are in a time in history where technology is unprecedented, is an unprecedented power and the and the ability to solve big grand challenge like problems. But also, as we have seen repeatedly in history, they contain the seeds of adverse and equally powerful unintended consequences. Now, history will show that um, uh, we always move in the right direction because as humanity, we make uh, the sound decisions on using technology for solving big problems. At the same time, because of the of the fact that the technology is very powerful as well, and the unintended consequences are equally powerful, we have to, I think, uh, have our, our students understand this uh, immense, uh, uh, not dilemmas, but but the potential dilemmas that they may face in the future. Therefore, I, th I the point that I'm trying to make is that in addition to uh, advanced technical skills and competence, today's engineers also need to understand and consider impact they have to society. And this impact can be multiple. It can be either in decision making uh, in a big corporate uh, um, uh, entity or in government or uh, any other parts in which engineers can play a role in terms of policy as well. And so engineering policy has always been part of a, 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 a interrelated and I think will be even more interrelated into the future. In the future, there is a lot of interesting, uh, uh, thought-provoking articles and publications in recent years that uh, mention this uh, and talk about this in, in many different ways as well. And this is particularly the case when we have important new technologies like uh, AI that is coming up to essentially push the, 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 the uh, intersection or the interface between uh, technology and humanity in many different ways as well. So this uh, requires that we have a strong knowledge of ethical and civic uh, responsibilities as well. So um, when you look at the concept of uh, trustworthiness or trust is a combination of um, combining technical competence along with let's call it character, and the combination of the two leads to trustworthiness, and um, I'm not the first to say that this is sorely missed mis in today's fast-changing world. We see this manifested everywhere today. Um, when you read the newspapers or the, or the, the news events that are happening, you can see a, a tremendous uh, lack of uh, trustworthiness of the world at large, not to engineers, uh, but to many other uh, institutions, but certainly by making sure that this trustworthiness is, is, an, is an attribute that we um, cultivate more perhaps in, in, in our curricula and in our graduates, I think it's an important and hopefully a, a, a useful attribute that our graduates should have. So finally, uh, the key theme of this presentation is that technology and development and practice are are inseparable from the examination of ethics, values, and societal impact. Um, and again, this is something that we see more and more. Um, and uh, it addresses issues that are often in engineering education. I certainly, um, you, when I was an undergraduate in uh, in technical universities, uh, like uh, in Asian Technical University of Athens, uh, has been primarily technical education, almost exclusively that. Now, as uh, having finished at Greek high school, I must say that uh, we learned a lot about uh, the um, 
values and ethics are from the ancient uh, history, uh, the history of ancient Greece, which has a lot of uh, addresses very much the issue of uh, ethics and, and, and the law and uh, unintended consequences as well. So I don't, I can say that uh, as an overall education, uh, we have not been, uh, had the, the appropriate education in, uh, as I was growing up in, in, in a country like Greece, but I think that uh, often um, in, uh, in our modern curricula, we try to sort of uh, separate the two. And uh, I think it's time that we have a better um, uh, Sort of a in, uh, in, incorporation of the of the direction of uh, uh, the concept that I'm trying to mention here, the concept of trustworthiness in in our curricula as well. So I have used this slide often, and this is how I look at technology and engineering. And I use a very um, a very loose definition. Um, and I, I this is a paraphrasing from a book by Brian Arthur that was published in 2008 on the nature of technology. And my simple definition of technology when I talk to students, when I talk to parents, uh, when I talk to potential uh, applicants to engineering schools, I said that it is leveraging phenomena for useful purposes. So it's kind of an interesting definition because by, by doing that, you essentially capture pretty much all the things that engineering technology addresses today. Because phenomena can be, and if you look back in, in, uh, in, the, in uh, the history of technology and evolution, uh, mostly physical. Uh, in the past, in the old times, it was essentially uh, fundamental physics. Uh, if you remember um, uh, Archimedes' uh, theories and, and how things uh, flowed and things like that. Uh, then, um, with the understanding of technology more and, and science, we started understanding chemical phenomena, let's say catalysis. And geological phenomena are important for groundwater, or more recently, obviously, biological phenomena in which we do, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, uh, progress that has been made there. Um, and the, uh, the discovery of vaccines against COVID, for instance, it was a remarkable achievement that uh, uh, the acceleration of which would not have been possible without technology. In this direction, you have increased direction of increased complexity. Although if you talk to a physicist, will tell you that everything is physics and I will not <laughs> have this conversation now, but certainly uh, in terms of uh, what we see happening in front of us, physics, chemistry, uh, geology or natural uh, uh, sciences, biology clearly. But I think we are going more and more also in the direction of engineering and technology addressing social and behavioral phenomena. Whether this is through uh, a simple definition as in social media, or this is something much more complex, uh, which I think is happening. I'm trying to, to use, for example, uh, AI and machine learning and data sciences in order to understand social and behavioral phenomena. I think there's this additional increased complexity, but at the same time, a convergence in which engineering and technology play an important role. And useful, another very important word here is useful, because if you look at this uh, definition, useful is the particular uh, word that addresses the issue of ethics, because what's useful to somebody, to someone, may not be useful to another. So in many different ways, uh, this simple definition captures essentially the essence of technology and engineering and how we use it today. And by uh, purposes, I also include the discovery of new phenomena, because people sometimes, uh, what we do in engineering, sometimes inseparable from uh, uh, the natural sciences. Sometimes a lot of engineering is discovery new things or the discovery of new things. So the, the, front, the, the boundary between the two is not uh, uh, impermeable and there is a lot of things going back and forth. So the most important thing to realize is that we live in a world where the, 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 there is a constant acceleration and technology in, uh, goes exponentially fast. Um, so that's something that I have to um, uh, emphasize because the world is is moving in a exponentially fast uh, changes here. We see this every day. Uh, the reason of this is obviously uh, affiliated with uh, what we call perhaps uh, technology. I, I mean Moore's law, but there's actually something more than that. And uh, I believe that the uh, exponential acceleration that we see today. Is, it's not simply the fact that we can uh, fit more uh, features in a, in, a, in a microchip, 
but actually it's fundamental to the definition of uh, uh, technology. And this is essentially having to do with the fact that, uh, uh, that if the technology speed is proportional to it, then you, what you have is, is you can write this simple equation here, which is the rate of change of technology, let's say if it's proportional to it, then this gives you an exponential change. In fact, the change can be faster than exponential. And uh, this could be a singularity if, and if this, uh, 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 on the right-hand side, the rate of change is, is proportional to a higher power of, of let's say, uh, the, 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 the technology state, if you wish, and it's a power of m where n is greater than one, then if you were to do some simple mathematics and integrate this equation, then you find that, uh, in fact, this can lead to a singularity. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who um, wrote a wonderful book, The Singularity is Near, some time ago, and it's kind of a visionary in this sense, he has predicted that, in fact, uh, the, the rate of technology change is not, not only exponential, but it's faster than that. The essential com concept here is that if you look at energy, materials or knowledge and that has been said by many before uh, is that only knowledge has the property that you generate more knowledge the more you consume it in other words there is an accelerated uh, tendency that's inherent to the definition of knowledge and to the definition of what we do whereas materials the more you consume perhaps the less you create uh, then, then you, you you lose or you you, um, you you don't create as much and the same thing is true for energy on the on the other hand knowledge has this interesting uh, uh, attribute to it and the same thing can be said about innovation um, I have a couple of slides that emphasizes this a little bit more uh, uh, Krishna mentioned that I'm a chemical engineer, so I have used a lot of uh, chemical kinetics to understand the evolution of technology. So uh, I will do this, for example, by let's assume that you have linear kinetics. So let's say technology leads to more technology. So this is if, if any of you have taken any chemical reaction uh, 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 kinetics uh, 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 course knows that in this particular case, then the rate of change is proportional to A, and that gives you A exponential, and that is essentially Moore's law. So again, I don't want to trivialize this, but uh, in many ways, uh, the fact that we have exponential changes is not simply the fact that we, that happens that we can get the technology moves with a speed that has to do with physics, uh, but I think it's more than in some way, some, something that is perhaps more general. And if you were to go there, and let's assume you take quadratic kinetics, and let's say that, that the technology requires a collision with another technology, in this case, to give you twice that, then this is proportional to what I mentioned before, a power of two. And if you integrate this equation, then you can easily see that you can have singularity. So when T time approaches a critical time, perhaps then you have very, very fast technology. Is this going to happen? Uh, and this is a schematic actually that's taken from uh, uh, Kurzweil's uh, uh, definition here. And so is this the direction that we're going? Are we going this direction? People will tell you that perhaps with the tremendous power of AI, we may actually be approaching something that is faster than exponential and you see this every day in in many of the of the of the new things that are happening so um the these are this is fascinating because one can take advantage of these very fast moving technologies to solve big problems and as i, as I will mention in a moment at the same time the extra, extraordinary power of technology provides all these unintended consequences which we have to start thinking about in a bigger way in, in many ways, we live in an era of exponentials. I'm not the first person to say that, and I don't think I'll be the last one. Certainly technology. Population has been uh, in, a, in an exponential growth. Uh, if you look back in, uh, let's say, the world's history, uh, and this is, uh, so, so historically over the last uh, you know, couple of centuries, you can see clearly there is a, an exponential growth. The good news is that uh, this is not going to continue into the um, into the uh, foreseeable future, and I think at some point we're going to have stabilization. Clearly, we know that uh, the population is likely to stabilize at around nine or ten billion. The environment, on the other hand, has also an exponential growth. This is the uh, carbon dioxide concentration in the environment. You can see clearly this part as well. In many ways, 
COVID-19 also brought in an era of exponentials. So this is not a concept that we have not been um, familiar with. And as I said, the, um, uh, if you remember uh, the onset of, of COVID, number of people felt thought that this is a sort of a, a predictable thing it's a linear that had a linear uh, prediction and that you was going to essentially extrapolate linearly and things that were going to be able to to see a foreseeable uh, end to this and yet that's that, that did not happen because infection um uh, grows exponentially fast at the beginning at least and i think this is what we saw in many different ways omicron uh, was another uh, uh, verification of this uh, Delta variant uh, in India last year, about this time of the year, was another uh, example of how um, exponential growth can happen in 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 place like this. So the good news, of course, is that if we um, combine the exponential part of technology to any phenomena that have exponential aspects to it, including the climate, the probability of us being able to successfully address them is very high because we can use, in some sense, one exponential to, to counter another. I have used this slide also to show that uh, I am obviously a very engineering-centric person. I have been at the end of the school for quite a while, so I believe a lot in the power of engineering and technology in the sense that I mentioned before, leverage phenomena for useful purposes. And, you know, we can uh, take, let's say, CS or EE or any other discipline and it moves the, it has the power to enable natural sciences medicine the arts and social sciences as well and essentially to solve grand challenge problems that are associated with all these uh, aspects with um, <clears throat> i must say that in my institution there was a meeting about a couple of months ago on what are the big issues associated with different parts of the university in medicine arts and, and, and the like and almost uh, overwhelmingly, the answer was the importance of technology in coming in and solving big problems. Medicine specifically is something that you will see a tremendous amount of convergence in the future. And, and I'm talking about the future, I'm talking about in the near future as well. So um, this points all to the importance of what we do uh, in terms of providing uh, the ability to solve big problems. So, I will summarize what I just said in a couple of slides before, that I believe that technology and engineering are enabled disciplines of our time, that because they're exponentially growing and because they're converging. And these two aspects are fundamental, they're important, and they are uh, integral, integral part, parts of the world today. Um, and why is the enabling discipline of our times? Because human nature does not change exponentially fast, if anything, our human nature remained the same. Uh, in recent years, it has gone south, actually. So <laughs> instead of going uh, further up, I think we are we're going in the in the wrong direction to some extent. I'm not. I'm all. I'm, I'm an optimist, and so I say this with a sort of a, uh, a tongue-in-cheek type of uh, 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 saying it. But uh, clearly, we see that uh, there is a lot of interesting things that are happening, and you know this uh, intertwining of the technology with humanity will become more and more in the future. Now, a lot of the mention of the of this part of technology can be used to solve big problems. So I'm talking, uh, let's consider, for example, the National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges. Um, I mentioned the NAE Grand Challenges, were, which were articulated in 2008, not for any other reason, but because I believe that encapsulate essentially Maslow's hierarchy and Maslow, Maslow is uh, yeah, this uh, hierarchy is a, it, it is a psychological hierarchy for the needs of individuals, uh, and it uh, it sort of extrapolates this to the planet at large. And so, just like in Maslow's hierarchy for the individual, we have to worry about physiological safety, love and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. To some extent, the uh, the grand challenges of engineering address kind of the same steps. For instance, in terms of physiological needs, we're talking about sustainability. In terms of safety, we're talking about security. In terms of uh, uh, end health. And in terms of enriching life, this is uh, esteem or love and belonging and self-actualization. I, I mean, I, I one should not take this too, to, a, to a much larger, to, to a very um, uh, uh, you know, literal extent. However, there is an analogy between this and this. And 
uh, one thing that I have been always uh, thinking about when I was talking about the grand challenges <clears throat> often is that the National Academy did not address behavioral or societal um, issues. And of course, one of the reasons is that uh, NAE is an uh, Academy of Engineering. So perhaps uh, there was a, a deference to uh, going to behavioral and societal uh, um, uh, issues that perhaps are part of other uh, uh, members of the Academy, like the National Academy of Sciences and others. Nonetheless, these um, grand challenges on making solar energy economical, they're still part of our uh, world today. Energy from fusion, access to clean water, securing cyber, cyber uh, space, uh, urban infrastructure, engineering better medicines, uh, and enriching life. And so whether these grand challenges will be, will be the same if, uh, if they were to be articulated today, it's a question. However, these buckets will still remain the same for sustainability, security, health, or, or enriching life. And I dare say that if we were to look again at grand challenges today, I think you will probably have another bucket that has to do with social phenomena. And so, um, so this is my, um, uh, uh, I, I feel that grand challenges are important because they focus the mind. Um, they are very attractive to students who want to come to engineering to solve big problems. And that increases the demographics that our, our engineering students um, uh, we see in the classroom today. And this is um, essentially changes the conversation about engineering. In the past, engineering was a lot about, in many ways, um, uh, uh, skills of technical skills, uh, solving differential equations, uh, you know, being able to do apply logic in a very significant way. Today, in addition to this, because all these grand challenges have some societal impact, you would want to make solar energy economical or develop carbon sequestration. These are all driven by some societal need. Uh, and therefore, this is the component that of the trustworthiness that I mentioned. If we were to solve these big grand challenges, essentially we tell the world that, you, that, they are, um, that there, is, there are some higher purpose in, in trying to be an engineer and technologist and not simply someone who sits in a cubicle and you know, uh, is an excellent technician, but di divorces themselves from the societal impact of engineering. And why therefore, therefore grand challenges? Because um, it allow all this technology allows us to set achievable goals for all humanity. And you may see um, the people out there that say, well, <clears throat> sometimes this is uh, 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 technologies, technologies look at uh, techno solutions and therefore they are um, you know, ignoring uh, aspects of, of society. I, uh, I don't believe that this is accurate, or, and I don't believe that this is how engineers should be perceived. Uh, I think, and one way to change this is to basically include in our way by which we, we deal with technology and engineering uh, the societal impact, and that is the whole concept of trustworthiness that I mentioned. Finally, if you were to work in grand challenges, it's essentially you setting a goal. And when you set the goal is, a, is a, an ethical question. When you pr propose or pursue certain goal, essentially is because there's some ethical question associated with that. I should mention a little bit the Grand Challenges Scholars Program, which is a, a program that we co-founded at USC Duke and All-In in 2009. And the idea was to essentially um, address the Grand Challenges, but in, in the concept of mindset, uh, research and creativity, uh, multidisciplinary, what I call engineering plus, innovation and entrepreneurship, because without innovation, a lot of the things that are happening here will never be able to be um, uh, uh, developed. Uh, and importantly, cultural and societal impact. These were the five mindsets. This have been uh, rephrased in many different ways. This is a picture from the uh, global, uh, Grand Challenge Global Summit in London in 2019. This is the last time the, the Grand Challenges uh, Summit happened. And actually this is from Imperial College um, when uh, it's, uh, and this is uh, a team from UAC, it was an all women team actually that participated in the solution in, in, the, in the business plan competition. We're very, uh, I was very happy to be able to, um, to be part of this, of that particular meeting as well. Uh, this program, by the way, um, uh, uh, was the winner of this year's 2022 NA Gordon Prize. We're very uh, humbled to receive this, uh, this recognition. 
Uh, the program has been adopted by many schools globally, and uh, so I want it. And this was consistent with the World Economic Forum report way back in the 2000s on the added skills for the 21st century on creativity, leadership, and perseverance. Now, you, you say, well, you know, the world is not simply the National Academy of Engineering of the United States. So, you know, there are grand challenges associated with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so many of them actually are similar to the um, uh, National Academy of Engineering grand challenges. A lot of it has to do with the clean water, for instance, or there is affordable and clean energy. So there is an overlap between the grand challenges of the NAE and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. What is different is that there is a lot of uh, societal uh, impacts, uh, societal uh, items here that depend almost exclusively on the issues, uh, human issues, and their human-centric issues, no poverty, gender equality, peace, justice, and, and, and the like. And at some point, the question will be, should engineers and technologists also be involved in this? And the answer, in, from my opinion, is yes, because <clears throat> we are able to understand, we should be able to understand better the way societies organize as well, the way uh, we think as humans and behave as human as well, in a good possible, in a good way as, for all that. Um, social work, uh, researchers have articulated grand challenges for social work. Actually, I was part of that, um, of that work because um, it started actually at USC back in 2012 or 11. Um, this is when I, essentially uh, challenge our colleagues and social work to what are your grand challenges? And then around 2015 or 16, they articulated these grand challenges, uh, individual and family well-being, just society, stronger social fabric. Many of these can be, um, have a strong partnership or in inclusion of technology in many different ways as well. So uh, this is the convergent aspects of technology that I mentioned before. And that's something I think we have to not only uh, shy away, not, not shy away from it, but actually embrace it in many different ways. So human setting grand challenges, I'll give you an example of a specific problem that we looked at um, in a class, uh, a civil engineering class, which is now has become a, a, a regular class in our curriculum to engineer innovation with focus on human crisis. So this is a, a, uh, a class that was dedicated to a uh, specific problem. How do you deal with the human crisis associated with a refugee camp, in this case, in the Greek island of Lesbos, which is over here? Uh, by the way, I was not involved. This was not my idea. I was not involved in the, I was not even invited <laughs> to go there. I, as a dean, I had to uh, simply support this particular class. Uh, this was a transformative class for our students. At the beginning, they thought they had all these ideas on how to innovate to use engineering technology to solve the problems of people in that refugee camp. Well, then they visited the, 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 the camp, and this is a, a part of the visit there, and then they realized how off they were in terms of understanding initially what potentially the needs of these people will be there. And after they visited there, they, it was a life transforming experience because they realized that um, when you deal with human issues, many of the things that you think are important to you not necessarily apply to others. And so in many ways, when they came back, uh, they came back with a different mindset. Out of this class, actually, there were a number of designs studied, a number of these uh, sort of uh, became fledgling companies and uh, for, for social good. And one of them is, a couple of them are still existing and they're doing very well. So this actually was just to give you a little bit of a, uh, was documented in a documentary called Lives Not Greats. Um, it is actually available on PBS, the public uh, television station in the United States. And this is a, the poster of this uh, uh, documentary it was published in May of 2021. And the, I, I should say that uh, actually I am listed as an executive producer because uh, so, so I put it on my resume because I am uh, I suppose because I I uh, funded the, the the project so in some sense it's kind of a little funny but this is actually the refugee camp over here it's our student uh, who's the student who visited this and you can see how you can you can see the the, the stark contrast between 
uh, you know, um, uh, engineering students in a, a private American university facing the reality of people in a refugee camp. I should mention that these refugee camps do not exist anymore because they were put on fire and tragically, um, uh, these, these things, uh, I don't know what happened to the population there, but uh, certainly they don't exist anymore in the island of Lesbos. So let's talk about the future engineer of 2020. In uh, Back into, well, what do I mean by that? Back in 2004, the National Academy presented a, a, a um, report called the engineer of 2020. Well, the engineer of 2020 graduated two years ago. So the question is, what will be the future engineer of 2020 if we were to have a, a study of what are the the, 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 car, the attributes of the engineer of 2020? Would they be the same as the ones that were articulated back in 2004? My answer is that probably uh, a number of them will be the same and a number of them will be different. And I think society will increasingly demand purpose and trustworthiness, competence and character. And I mentioned many of this uh, before, because powerful technology leads to powerful unintended consequences, but also can address the solution of big problems. And I think we will be increasingly asking our graduates to solve what I call human-centric problems. And I use the word wicked. Now, um, people talk about wicked problems. My uh, take on wicked problems is that uh, wicked problems are usually associated with problems when humans are involved. And so we have to we have to think about how to address these issues. Uh, and I think we'll be getting closer and closer to this. Um, it's very fascinating to see the younger generation, uh, Gen Z, how interested they are, for example, in addressing these type of questions. And many of them addressing them becomes a moral decision. And so I believe that an addendum or to engineer of 2020 will be based on purpose and character, in addition, of course, to technical competence that all engineering schools provide in an excellent way. And uh, this was the, the model and the, and, the, and the way by which we were doing this uh, significantly all the time. And as I, I want to sort of provide this sort of a simple equation uh, that trust is the combination of competence and character, um, you would definitely, um, uh, we would like our graduates to have the, the um, a combination of the two uh, in, in, in a way that, in essence, actually, that's actually part of leadership as well, that you don't need only people who are competent, but also uh, people that um, use their competence in a way that is beneficial to the world at large. And that's what essentially is the whole concept of trust or trustworthiness that I want to mention. So, I think I'm, I'm saying the same thing here. Um, if you look at the, the credibility, for instance, um, and you look at competence and character, there are two aspects to it, right? With respect to uh, credibility, competence, uh, capabilities, talent, attitude, skills, and knowledge, these are all very important. And as I mentioned, these are part of what we do routinely in engineering education. Also results, uh, what's performance, what's past, or current, or anticipated. So this is part of the competence. At the same time, there are other aspects that have to be incorporated in what we do from integrity to intent. Uh, intent is a, a, the purpose that I mentioned before. Integrity is on the uh, courage, humility. And this is a lot of this that have to also deal with uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. A lot of innovation aspects um, is, uh, uh, are measured by courage, uh, the ability to uh, you know, be able to um, uh, fail and then uh, uh, start again. Uh, so behavior. So these are a lot of things that are already um, traits of a, a, a successful engineers. At the same time, I think um, it's, it's good to articulate them in this particular way. And I took a lot of this from Steve Covey's book, The Speed of Trust, um, which uh, I was uh, impressed with the way by which um, a, you know trust trustworthiness is, is put together. Um, I mentioned this uh, because in addition to knowledge and skills, then the question is how you develop, so, develop also mindsets. And I think this is what the Grand Challenges Scholars Program is trying to do, is to give, provide the ability to, in addition to providing the knowledge and skills, which we know that, um, is, uh, particularly on skills, uh, they are some things that are need to, to be upgraded pretty much 
every year or every other year. Um, and that's why we have continued education. Mindsets are things that hopefully stay with you for the remainder of your education and the remainder of your career. And so I know there is the concept of growth mindset. This is something that um, I, because I don't know a lot about the psychological aspects to it, I call it mindsets of change so that you are able to move along this technology exponent, this exponential. I have a sort of a, a small uh, way to describe it and I call it uh, uh, hardly exponential and I will uh, talk to you a little bit about it as, as I close this, this presentation. As opposed to a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset in some way is the tangent to this technology curve here. If, if the technology curve is exponential and you, we work on the, on the, with a fixed mindset, we simply extrapolate linearly. And that's a typical reaction to change. It happens in policy, politics for sure. And sometimes in academia, we extrapolate on a straight line. We, we fail to see the fact that things are changing much faster than that. And this is because our mindset is some, sometimes easier to work in this way rather than, than adapt something that's much more, um, uh, uh, not adventurous, but much more uh, um, uh, exciting in some way, which is the mindset of change. And um, in many ways as well, trust is the, 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 the difference between where the world is today, where we thought the world is going to be with a fixed mindset. And this, there is a need to be able to move along this exponential faster. So if we don't do this, then we pay a tax. And this tax is the gap between this fixed mindset and then this mindset of change. And the tax we pay when, when trust is absent, organizations that are able to have uh, trustworthiness in, in their organization, they can move along this curve here in a much more seamless way, as opposed to those who do not. And in this case, there is a penalty that you pay, and this penalty actually increases as a function of time in this particular schematic. So um, I, I summarize the Grand Challenge Scholars Program way to look at it uh, as I met you you saw the the attributes of it and again I don't look at this as simply the only solution to problem to to sort of a uh, reform or, or, or rethink uh, engineer education because a lot of this is outside the curriculum but it when I, I look at the these five mindset as a combination of competence and of character and purpose the competence has to do with uh, super te technical skills, and knowledge to lead the exponential change technology. I call it hug the exponential. This is entirely technical understanding new technologies, AI, data sciences, machine learning, uh, you know, uh, computational biology, all the things that help us advance uh, quantum mechanics, quantum computing, advance our technical skills. Um, another part of competence is what I call engineering plus, which is engineering plus X, and X can be anything. And this is particularly if it is human centric. So these, I think, are important aspects of competence that we can bring to the table and be able to address big problems. And then in order to have an impact, you have to have innovation. And innovation is an entrepreneurship, creates new market, new job, and in many ways allows you to redesign yourself. I think we find ourselves in a part of the in, in the time in the world where people always look to reinvent in some way. Um, I mention a lot to people that my busiest time for me is the summer, because every summer I have to think how to reinvent what we do in the school. And uh, it's, uh, in, a, in a way, it's, uh, you need to be able to think about uh, you know, how to essentially keep moving along these this fast changing times. But then you have to start talking about understanding cultures, understanding having the cultural awareness, and be able to understand the impact that we have on society. I call it heroic engineering uh, and the importance of technology ethics. So in a way, the previous five mindsets for the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, I now look at them as part of competence and part of character and purpose. So the combination of them, therefore, provides this trustworthiness, hopefully, um, to be um, uh, uh, become part of some sort of our curriculum as well. So I will close with two more slides, um, and because all these have to do with technology ethics. When we do decision making, um, we have to make sure that they are smart. This is where, let's say, uh, illogical thinking comes. 
legal, obviously this is because society uh, imposes that, requires that, but also ethical. So often, uh, we, uh, and hopefully there is an intersection which is smart, ethical, and legal, and at that intersection, this is the, 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 the way by which we make those decisions. This is where technology uh, um, uh, interacts with, uh, with uh, uh, society, but also the ethical aspects of, of, of how we want to, to look at technology as well. Now, often uh, you start with a decision here, but the evolution is such that takes you actually outside of the particular intersection. And this has to do when you have unintended consequences in which you started uh, in a, a particular uh, journey with this, this in this intersection, but then somehow you find out yourself that unintended consequences pushes either this particular um, policy or corporation or, or whatever we do in a direction that, that doesn't go through this, uh, this intersection is no longer uh, finite, uh, it is, does no longer exist. And this is actually where you have to worry about, um, you know, making a change and make a course correction. And this is where uh, trustworthiness will have to come in. So then this asks the question, how do you reimagine re the, cu the curriculum? So I think we need to reimagine the non-engineering part of engineering education. And we're doing this actually at USC. So we created an engineering humanities program that talk talks a lot about ethics and society and uh, ethos and characters. And this is a program that we started this year. Uh, with some of these courses were existing, but these are things that we have to start thinking and, and uh, making sure that our, our students understand uh, this, the impact they can have. This is part of the general education requirements, but actually focus a lot on the specific components that technology brings into, into, the, into uh, the picture. So um, this changes the conversation about engineering, who we are, what we do, and what we look like. So in a way, it has also a concept of diversity in it. Um, I wanted to show you that uh, we were part of this change since the 2015. Uh, there's a diversity initiative at the ASWE, the American Society of Engineering Education. For this, the school, my school received the 2017 President's Award for the effort that we did in, in this area. And uh, in the process, I had to also the opportunity to meet with the President of the United States back in 2015, uh, and uh, because uh, tried to explain what we were doing, and he was very interested in it, so I was very happy to uh, be able to have that conversation. So I will close by making some sort of a using some sort of a um, uh, lines for this: uh, highly exponential engineering plus innovation heroic engineering, the cultural mind. And uh, I will close by saying that powerful and convergent technology help us address and solve important problems. Creating trustworthy engineers is important because then we were uh, tell the world that we can be the providers of solutions that are impactful and change the conversation about engineering and engineering education. And I always close with a in a lot of my presentations with a quotation from David Deutsch. Uh, David Deutsch is a quantum physicist at uh, Oxford University, wrote a wonderful book called The Beginning of Infinity. And he says that problems are inevitable, but all problems are solvable. So in that is a very optimistic view of the world. It's one that I, I share uh, quite as well. And so that will be the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Yonis. That was fantastic. Very awesome uh, very inspirational and uh, insightful time for a few questions come on oh, audience text questions if you want to I want me to unmute you i can unmute you anybody want to jump in okay while we are waiting i have a couple of comments myself uh this uh, a lot of this uh, in order to implement a lot of these ideas that you have presented it seems to me that the Grand Challenges program has been very instrumental. It's a practical way to develop students in that direction, right? Yes. And so, so then my, my question then is, how do we scale it up? How do we go beyond those 100 colleges and how do we make it more global? What, what is, how do we take the 100 so colleges? A... <laughs> Good point. Um, so right now, the Grand Challenges Scholars Program um, 
so so what we need to do is uh, do a lot more um sort of uh, um, spread the word actually i think um we had uh, the national academy uh, had an office uh, in uh, in dc on on this um, uh, topic um right now this office has moved to Arizona State University, and I think uh, there is a committee that um, in which I am part of the um, sort of a, uh, executive committee. We are planning to see what's the 2.0 version and how to to, to uh, expand it uh, globally. I think um, there are so many good things about the program, uh, and there also the way it was it was uh, uh, originally uh, articulated. Had a little bit of a misunderstanding. People thought that this is only applicable to U.S. universities. I think uh, so. In many ways, it was not publicly well positioned to to to, to spread it. But I can tell you that uh, there is quite a bit of uh, uh, interest in Europe. For instance, I Italy. Um, I visited Romania back in 2019 pre-COVID and 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 talked to a number of people there that were interested in Brazil. So there's a lot of, uh, I think it's an ideal global movement that can be put in that way. Uh, the, the whole concept is to make sure we present it in terms of these global buckets rather than in terms of very, very specific uh, 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 individual grand challenges. Many people, when they see the very specific individual grand challenges, say, well, I am not doing exactly that, I'm doing circuits. So why would you be interested in this? And so, but if you look at it and say, well, you're doing this because of that, then I think people can can, can relate to it. Uh, I can tell you there is tremendous interest from our uh, students and they, they're very excited about it. Great. So, uh, just uh, my, since I'm doing a lot of work with many colleges in India now, I'm sure Hans also would like to be involved along with me in your plans for globalizing yeah. grand challenges. If you can keep that Absolutely. in mind, we can have a separate conversation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Of yeah. Question here, the relevance of trustworthiness has made a quantum jump in the past year. Are you are you in conversation with the larger business community about your initiatives? So I, the only thing I can say is that, so at USC I have a big corporate board, um, big, a corporate board. <laughs> so we have people from, from uh, uh, that uh, are very interested in what we do. I hope that the I think we're losing um, connection from somebody. Maybe Yannis. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, no, you're back. You're back. Engineering will be something that uh, will uh, attract the attention of uh, more, a number of Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, let's can you hear me? We have, uh, yeah. So the uh, the other question is, I think uh, you you, pro you all, uh, probably already answered it, but can you give a specific example of your college experience in connecting engineering and society? Uh, the uh, audio is not coming in for some reason. Okay. Can you can you not hear me? Yeah. Now I can hear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you already did this during the talk. I noticed, uh -huh. but uh, I guess you might want to repeat your yeah. experience about how you connected society and engineering in your own college. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um. So we do a number of things. Um. So one interesting thing, uh, well, we do competitions that have to do with uh, societal impact. So we have the so-called Min Family Challenge, which is uh, how to uh, create innovation that uh, serves uh, societal good. Um, you know, this, this situation with the refugee crisis was one of them. We have a partnership with the School of Social Work uh, on AI for society. So this is called, it's a center for AI and society. Um, so this is actually because the social work folks are interested in solving problems of the type that I mentioned before, right? Um, societal impact um, in, in, in other uh, uh, partnerships with other, I think in a school, in a university like the University of USC, where there is a lot of partnership between, there's multiple schools in different areas, policy, law, medicine, and so on and so forth. The intersections are so uh, powerful and so fertile. And I think this is what should be uh, sought after. 
Um, and it, so, you know, um, when I look, for example, at the traditional engineering schools, um, uh, for instance, the National Technical University of Athens, when I, when I was there, it's essentially a, uh, a technical school, right? Um, and I think from that perspective, they have to uh, reach out to schools that are not uh, simply technical, but they also look at, uh, at, at solving big problems. I know the IITs in India perhaps need to do the same and, and expand and, and, and reach out to other entities that are uh, relevant to them. Uh, creating alliances and partnerships of this type, I think, are important. Um, and because you don't want to simply um, uh, innovate in vacuum, but I think not, not I'm not saying that people innovate in vacuum, but it's important to have the societal uh, direction. I think that will be very important as well. Last question, and I hand it over to Hans. Uh, if you if you look at the you know, the media and news and other places, it all it almost sounds like there's an increasing level of uh, problems with in integrity and ethics in all over the world, <laughs> going the wrong direction. So to what yes. we're talking about today. That's what exactly right. On that? politics economics well, you know I, I think this is yeah this is this is a um, a uh, an example of the power of technology uh going in unintended consequences i think that's it's as simple as that social media is a classical example of this uh, i can tell you that uh, a number of uh, unintended events that happen in the world today are driven by social media that uh, um you know uh, i have actually it is very similar to um a spreading of, a, of an infection in, in many different ways um, just like you have in COVID, you have susceptible to infection and you have infected people the same thing happens in social media you have people that are susceptible to infection and then you have infected people and the infected people uh infect those who are susceptible it's not very very different so you have to either immunize them or perhaps, or you know, have the ability of, of vaccines to some extent, or be able to recover. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a part of the of the world that we live we live in. And I think, uh, but at the same time, you see very healthy reactions of people that try to see and say that is not really what we are. Uh, we need to, do, to to make some change there. I think you will see this happening. But these are things that come in from these unintended consequences. The question you may ask, why do we have unintended consequences? I think we do because the world is complex. And so I have a very simple theory for this, and I may be wrong on this, but you know, in, uh, in uh, uh, dynamical systems, uh, the dynamical systems are, uh, when they are, if you have few degrees of freedom and you have everything, interaction is linear, then they are, they are, the outcomes are predictable. However, you have the dynamical systems in which there are multiple degrees of freedoms and freedom and the interaction is not linear, it's not linear. Then you have chaotic response reactions, and these are basically the unintended consequence. So that's my simple theory why we have unintended consequences. <laughs> All right, good for you. Uh, back to Hans. You might want to thank you very up. much, Chris. This has been inspiring, Yanis. We thank you, and of course, fortunately, uh, your presentation is recorded. And trust me, we will share it uh, with many of our members of our global community who who did not join us here. Very fascinating. Just a couple of things, just for the audience here, is both Yanis and also our dear sister and colleague Jenna Carpenter were members of the. A GEDC executive committee who's deeply engaged working with you on this, they both got the Gordon Prize Award this year. And that's that's a great honor. You've mentioned that prize, but you were humble not, not to mention your own name on that. And I, I just want to, I just want to oh, well. say, okay. I think the other comment I want to make and deeply agree with my, my friend uh, Krishna, this is critical for students. And what I want to find a new creative ways to engage your students in California with Krishnas and others in our Cape Town conference this November. Let's find creative ways to engage and connect our students with global community of students. And that's a fundamental strategic interest value of both Ivy's GDC and the IUC. That's one point. The other one I just want to make is certainly our Cape Town conference. I want to, you know, just remind everybody, call for papers and all that. The, Finally, uh, we are 
very have been awesome to work with women engineering leaders over the last uh, couple of years and we just published our india and africa editions of rising to the top written by these women engineers and it's just really fascinating and we've begun now working on two more editions uh, both uh, in the MENA Arab world and Southeast Asia. We'll keep you informed about that and uh, in this very, very, excite very exciting journey of working with our women leaders at a global level. Again, Janis, thank you for your very- Thank you. Thank you, Janis, for an outstanding presentation. <laughs> and uh, thank you, audience, and have a good evening, have a good morning to you. Have a cup, yes, first cup you. of coffee and, and out there and uh, enjoy the day. And be healthy, okay? Take thank care. you so much. It was a pleasure thank to be you. here. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.